Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the Ath Fellows this year. Donald Trump's astonishing presidential campaign has few historical precedents. When Trump first announced his candidacy in June of 2015, few could have imagined him becoming the Republican nominee, let alone a realistic contender for the presidency. The success of Trump's campaign can be explained by a number of things. Discontent with elite politicians, rising nativist and isolationist sentiment, or resurgent populism. But regardless of the reason, it is clear that this presidential election season will have historic implications, both for the future of the GOP and for America's democratic institutions. Tonight's panel consists of four members of CMC's government department who will explore the impact of Donald Trump on conservatism, the Republican Party, and the country. Professor Andrew Bush is the Crown Professor of Government and a George R. Roberts Fellow at CMC. Professor Zachary Corser is a graduate of the class of 1999 and is a visiting Assistant Professor of Government and Research Director for the Dreyer Roundtable. Professor Charles Kessler is the Dangler Dikema Distinguished Professor of Government, a Senior Fellow for the Claremont Institute, Editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and host of the American Mind video series. Professor William Vogley is the senior editor of the Claremont Review of Books and a visiting scholar at CMC's Salvatore Center. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please welcome the panelists to the Athenaeum. Well, I believe there might have been an order worked out by Ryan Williams about uh, the, the order we're <laughs> supposed to go in. Is that correct? So who's up first? Okay. All right. Well, I'll go first. Um, so I, I'm just going to start by saying that I think for a lot of people, um, the rise of Donald Trump seems like something of an aberration or uh, kind of a strange event, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even inexplicable. Um, and almost everyone was taken by surprise by it. Uh, I was certainly very much taken by surprise by it. Uh, but what I'd like to do in, in my brief comments now is to really urge us to think a little bit about ways in which he's not that surprising, or ways in which, in retrospect, you can kind of see a logic to how and why he he uh, achieved the uh, position in American politics that he has now. Uh, and I would say that there are both political aspects to that and also social or cultural aspects uh, to that. Uh, reasons that maybe we shouldn't have been as surprised as we were uh, that uh, Donald Trump rose, or that at least a Donald Trump-like <coughs> uh, candidate rose. Uh, so what about the politics? Well, <clears throat> if you look at the issues, uh, at least many of the issues that he has focused on, uh, these are issues that uh, have affected or have um, uh, brought into uh, you know, politics m many millions of Americans mm. uh, who felt before this that they didn't really have anyone speaking for their concerns. So uh, if you look specifically at trade and immigration, let's say, uh, at the presidential level, not necessarily the congressional level, but at the presidential level, there's been a kind of consensus between the major parties that there should be free trade and probably not very vigorous enforcement of immigration laws. Uh, and so you have these two issues that are both uh, valid concerns of the public where there was really nobody speaking for a significant body of, of opinion. Um, you can see this in coalitional terms Right, since, really since Nixon and, and McGovern, the white working class has shifted more toward the Republican uh, Party. It's become a, a, a bigger part of the Republican coalition. But up until this year, really Republicans have appealed to that constituency, largely with cultural issues, social issues, sometimes national security, sometimes uh, simply patriotism, but hardly ever economic issues uh, in the way that Trump has done. So Trump saw this vacuum uh, out there, and he appealed to this growing part of the Republican Party, 
uh, by uh, discussing economic issues that mm -hmm. were a concern to them that nobody else really has, has done. Uh, or take one, you know, another issue, uh, what I guess you could call the increasing tendency of American politics to be mired in euphemism. Right? The, the perception that many Americans have is that uh, it's difficult to have a straight discussion an honest discussion about some uh, issues that are difficult issues. And um, Trump seemed to speak to, to many of those folks as well. Uh, you add th to that the fact that about 65% of Americans roughly um, think that the country's on the wrong track. Uh, they're not satisfied with political leadership. They're looking for something new. They're looking for an outsider. Uh, and Trump really is the, the ultimate outsider. He has no political experience. Right, so he's, you can't get much more of an outsider than that, in, at least in, inside the realm of uh, political office holders. So you have all of those political factors that lead me to think, well, maybe it is not that surprising that someone like Trump came along and took advantage of those situations and spoke to some of those voters. And then you have what I would call the, the cultural aspect or the social, maybe social political uh, aspect. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people look at Trump and they say, well, how can someone who treats women that way or speaks about women that way, how, how can someone get that far in politics? Or how can someone who's that much of a narcissist get that far in politics? How can someone who uh, has such a challenging relationship with the truth frequently uh, get that far in politics? Uh, you know, questions, questions of that sort. Uh, how can someone get that far on the basis of just the celebrity, apparently? And I think the answer is um, that he's not an outlier. He's, in, in certain respects, different in degree, but he isn't really fundamentally different in kind from where this country has been headed in all sorts of ways uh, over the past several decades. Um, think about the question of narcissism. Cle I mean, I, I'm not a professional psychologist. I can't render a... Uh, a diagnosis, but you know, I think most people's kind of common sense understanding of narcissism would include a lot of Donald Trump's behavior. This society is now built on narcissism, ladies and gentlemen. This is a society where you get rich by inventing sticks that help you take pictures of yourself. Uh, this is a society in which self-actualization has become the ultimate value, beyond honor, beyond integrity, for, for many people, not all. Right, but it, it certainly has um, attained a position of prominence that it did not have before. Uh, what about his treatment of women? This is, to my mind and to many, to most people, I think very problematic. Uh, I suspect to everybody uh, up here problematic. Um, but we had a big debate in this country 20 years ago about, uh, you know, between uh, folks who said a person's conduct in those sorts of issues is a valid test of their fitness for high office. And another group who said, no, it isn't. It's not actually a uh, reasonable um, test for someone's fitness for high office. It doesn't matter. We should move on. Uh, and the people who said it was a valid test of a person's fitness for office lost the debate. And there was a new set of rules established. right? And Donald Trump is operating within those. Now, maybe there's a new, new set of rules as of last Friday. Uh, that's possible, but certainly uh, he's operating by the rules of the game as they were established in the 1990s. Not surprising. Uh, his relationship to the truth, well, this is problematic also. Uh, I would say it's not obviously more problematic for him than for his opponent. Right? They both have a real problem with this. So you might ask, how, how is it that we're in a situation where both major party candidates uh, have trouble telling the truth? Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for that, but I would suggest that one of the reasons is that we have devalued the concept of truth in the society. That in fact, we have gotten to the point where uh, for many people, uh, each person has their own truth, right? We have truths. We don't have a, a truth that's worth seeking. Uh, and this is, you know, it's not surprising that you wind up with two major party candidates who each have their own truth that seems to bear very little resemblance to objective reality, as far as anyone can tell a large part of the time. Uh, what about the, the, uh, the culture of, uh, 
uh, you could say uh, celebrity, right? The celebrity uh, cult of personality that comes up. Well, this is potentially dangerous. Trump is part of that, but Trump didn't invent that either. In fact, you could argue that President Obama invented that. Not invented it, certainly advanced it considerably in 2008. He was the one, after all, who campaigned with giant columns of Greek temples and uh, made elaborate promises about how as soon as he got elected, the oceans would stop rising and the earth would begin to heal itself. Uh, tr so Trump's, Trump's cult of personality is uh, very real, I think. Um, and it may be one step beyond, or may not even be one step beyond. But it certainly is not a difference in kind, perhaps in degree, from what's seen. So I would say that um, in cultural terms or social terms as well, uh, Donald Trump is floating on the stream of our culture as it exists right now. And that could be a troubling thing. It could be something that causes us to look in the mirror and ask ourselves you know, what we've done to our society. But I, I would not argue that he is a um, sort of unique uh, aberration in that sense. I think in a certain respect, both politically and socially, uh, you could argue that uh, in a sense maybe he was predictable. Is that a thoughtful pause, or are we done? No, I'm done. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that I've been talking for at least 10 minutes. At least 10 minutes. I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the one, the one other thing I would say very quickly is, uh, now that you've given me the chance yes. to, uh, <laughs> that uh, I think there's one way in which he is actually quite unique, uh, not just a continuation or a, an extension of previous pattern, and that's that I think um, if he were to become president, he would actually be a post-partisan president in a way that President Obama um, sort of intimated that he would be, but never actually uh, wound up being, being. I mean, he, President Obama, for you can debate the reasons, maybe it was his fault, maybe it was other people's fault, maybe it was a combination, but clearly he, he has turned out to be a very, um, very partisan president. Uh, uh, Trump, I think, would wind up being um, truly a post-partisan president really not connected to either party in any significant way. Um, but I think that that also might cause us to, uh, to wonder whether freeing a president from obligation or connection to a party organization uh, doesn't also have its costs. Um, so uh, I would just leave, leave it with that. He would be post-partisan in the sense that both Republicans and Democrats would oppose and hate him. Yes. 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 I think so that's he, would, he would bring Washington together in a way yes. that. Well, <laughs> you put it that way. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Nice to be. Um, I wrote a piece for the Claremont Review of Books digital um, thing. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it has a bigger name, but I can't quite remember. Um, in December of 2015, called um, The Reason I'm Anti-Anti-Trump, which I thought was a good equivocal uh, ground to stake out. I'm not for him, uh, but I'm against the people who are against him. Um, I've, I've, I've since graduated to um, uh, describing myself as someone who is um, reluctant, uh, qualified, uh, skeptical, um, uh, highly conditional uh, in uh, pro-Trump. Um, so I've, I've found a way to make my equivocal position even more so. Um, and I can, I, I can do so, I think, by contrasting it with what I take to be the three big positions on Mr. Trump that are out there. You have um, the Democratic Party, which is uh, fervently anti-Trump and treats him as the four horsemen of the apocalypse all put into one hairdo. And then um, there are many never Trump conservatives. Um, and finally, there is a smaller band of um, Trump supporters and enthusiasts and even kind of theoreticians. Um, I don't, uh, my position is, is uh, complicated as it is. Um, makes more sense to me than any of those three alternatives. Um, I'm not a member of the, um, uh, the, the Democratic um, 
Trump anathematizers. Um, they, the reason being that they say that Donald Trump is beyond the pale. Um, that may actually be right. However, they have said the same thing about uh, Mitt Romney and John McCain and George W. Bush. And so I think they've sort of run out of moral credit on that argument. Um, if you take the position that a, uh, a sort of honorable, decent, well-intentioned person like uh, Mitt Romney is, as uh, Paul uh, Krugman, for example, in the New York Times wrote, a charlatan, um, if you sort of freely toss around the accusation that um, Republican presidents and presidential candidates and national politicians generally are bigots and idiots and warmongers, um, then I think um, uh, the, the further the, the claim now that, but this time we really mean it. This Trump is a bad guy. That that was that was electoral hyperbole, but this this is the you know. I don't think that works, and it's it's not just a rebuke to the to the rhetorical excess, but the fact that uh, it seems to me that the the Trump phenomenon and the reaction to it uh, have have made clear that um, there is a uh, something kind of um, underhanded about this. Uh, conservatives are encouraged to believe that. Um, if they are sufficiently respectable and responsible, um, a certain element of docility, then they will sort of be allowed to sit at the grown-up table. But I don't think that ever turns out to be true. Trump is beyond the pale, but everybody um, uh, who has run for office in my party has been beyond the pale. So I think that Trump, whatever else he has done, has served the useful purpose of sort of drawing out and calling out this kind of excess. I am not, to take the second um, um, possibility, I am not a never Trump Republican. Um, people who uh, have made uh, uh, strenuous arguments on this point strike me as, uh, in some cases, explicitly, uh, but more often implicitly, saying that uh, Hillary Clinton is the lesser evil. Um, but. I don't know how to weigh that, but I, I think uh, the evil involved is quite considerable. Um, uh, Mrs. Clinton, um, I believe, is the first uh, presidential candidate to run on a slogan that is axiomatically true. She says, I'm with her, which means, as a logical necessity, that she's with me. And the truth of this is that uh, Hillary Clinton is someone who uh, can say for the first time in American politics to every single registered voter, whatever your opinion on the tough questions of the day about governance in America, that opinion is something that I either held in the past, <laughs> currently in some sense or another hold today, or will at some point in the future embrace. Whatever you think, I'm with you. If you're, if you're opposed to gay marriage, I'm with you. If you're in favor of it, I'm with you. Um, where, wherever you stand on Wall Street regulation, on going into Iraq, on uh, trade agreements, I'm with you. Uh, it strikes me that this sort of, um, I, I, I wasn't born last night. I realized that politicians fudge things occasionally, but the, um, the sort of shameless and, and, and comprehensive nature of this uh, s strikes me as peculiar. She was in the latest WikiLeaks release. Uh, she was uh, quoted um, explaining to a group of bankers that to get things done, you have to, it's, it's in politics, you have to have a public position and a private position. Well, I sort of understand how that works, but wh what bugs me is the first rule of Fight Club is you never talk about Fight Club. And the first rule of being an unprincipled cynic is you never inform an audience, hey, I'm an unprincipled cynic, and this is how it works. Um, if, I, if, if she's going to be that way, I at least want her to be that way sort of in a truly Machiavellian fashion, as opposed to a, um, a, a self-advertising Machiavellian fashion. 
so I find this a, a wholly unacceptable alternative. Uh, finally, there are, there are a group of, um, um, certainly a, a group of fervent Trump supporters and, and many people who have um, written sometimes <coughs> quite esoteric things um, explaining um, Donald Trump's uh, purpose and philosophy and, and world historical significance. Um, these uh, efforts are um, uh, impressive, but uh, not quite, for me, persuasive. Um, uh, George uh, Will wrote a, um, a book in 1990 called Men at Work about baseball, um, where it, there was this extremely, is, is all, you could only get from a Princeton PhD, this, this explanation of how the game works. And of all the dozens of things that had to happen and hundreds of things that had to be considered before you could um, um, uh, run a double play or, or, or hit the cutoff man. And I remember a, uh, a, a sports writer discussing the book afterwards saying that, um, in his career, he had interviewed uh, a lot of baseball players, and he appreciated what George Will was trying to do in Men at Work, but felt that if the game were really that complicated, none of the athletes he had known could have played it. Um, when I read um, the uh, most esoteric uh, explications of what Donald Trump is up to and mean uh, and intends, I, I remain quite sure that if somebody were to sit down and, and sort of lock him in a lecture hall and say, Mr. Trump, here's what you're about, um, no, there would be no timetable under which he would say, oh yeah, now I get it. Yes, that all makes sense to me. Um, so I think uh, that um, the, 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 uh, the Trumpism fails um, uh, largely because it involves at least for the moment, Mr. Trump himself. There may be some reconstituted post-election Trumpism that drops him from the picture and um, uh, develops new theoretical undertakings, understandings of what the conservative project is about, but I don't think that's a viable option right now. Not to mention that Trump himself is a uh, as Andy suggested, a strange and nasty piece of work, something that was reaffirmed most recently by the tape-recorded uh, revelations about his thoughts on courtship rituals. Um, so I am, um, I am left with the intention of um, um, approaching the, the November 8th decision this way. There are, um, uh, in 2008, there were 130 million votes cast in the presidential election, 129 million in 2012. Um, your odds of uh, casting the vote that makes the difference are much smaller than your odds of being struck by lightning on your way to the polling place. Um, so I think the, the sort of moral question is, um, do you, intend to put your grain of sand on the Hillary Dune or the Trump Dune. Um, my intention is to put mine on the Trump Dune as a way for the, the, the fragment of moral weight that that vote carries of making President-elect Hillary Clinton however slightly less adventurous and more abashed as she moves into um, the, uh, the work of her presidency as she moves into laying the groundwork for Chelsea Clinton's run in 2024. Um, so I think that um, it, it, with, without question, conservatives have a, a ton of work to do in making sense of what happened here and why and what it means and how to go forward. But I think at least for this moment, the, the project is to um, make Hillary Clinton's uh, mandate um, slightly less emphatic than it would be otherwise. Oh, to you, Zachary. Thank you very much. Um, it's hard to fit into 10 minutes uh, a um, searching examination of this election, uh, but I'll try to do my best, because I think I have 
some perspective and some answers uh, about how Donald J. Trump became the nominee of the Republican Party, something I never thought would pass my lips. Uh, Brandy Hoffine, I don't know if you came to the Athenaeum on Monday, but uh, Brandy Hoffine, class of 06, she's a deputy press secretary for uh, Barack Obama. And she was talking about you know, the difficulties of doing her job. And one of the things that she mentioned that really struck me is that one of the things that has made it increasingly difficult for her to work in media on behalf of an elected official is that it seems like both sides do not have differing interpretations of one fact. Both sides seem to have two different sets of facts. And it's very difficult for her to, to really know the perspective of a Republican or a Democrat on particular issues. And to me, it was a, a signal of, of something that I have observed you know, the last couple of years, actually, I would say since 2009, that in many ways, we have two Americas developing. And I think you know, the, the schisms that we're discovering um, both between the parties and within the parties are a reflection of those two Americas. And I think you know, this election is a, a signal to us all about uh, a change that's going on in American politics. I think the signs were all there. I agree with uh, Professor Bush that you know, looking at the signs, br uh, Donald Trump may not seem as extraordinary as, as uh, one would imagine. But I do think that we have come to an extraordinary point, uh, a point that uh, questions and gives us concern about the Constitution itself and where our politics lie. So one of the reasons I've been thinking about the Constitution in relation to polarization in particular is because this is a project that I've been working on with colleagues. Uh, the Dry Around Table um, had a conference uh, last October on the constitutional roots of polarization, basically asking the question, what if the gridlock that we're experiencing is the result of two increasingly incompatible versions of the Constitution? What if Republicans and Democrats are basically working under separate assumptions? Maybe they have their own idea of what's legitimate constitutionally. And what we found, I believe, I'm, I'm now having to write the introduction for what should be an edited volume, so I'm giving a lot, or even more thought to it right now and trying to make sense of the Constitution on this question. But I think what we found, we together with uh, uh, scholars from, well, not only from CMC, but Pomona and, and other places, that it's not so much that, that the parties are operating from two different assumptions about the Constitution, as they are reflecting a mutual dissatisfaction with the limits of constitutional government. What do I mean by that? I mean that both parties increasingly are placing policy considerations above constitutional norms. That the temptation exists both amongst Republicans and Democrats to permeate the parchment barriers between the executive, the Congress, and the courts in pursuit of an agenda, a policy agenda. Um, and that certain problems become so manifest between the two parties that normal political processes cannot seem to resolve them. And that sort of brings us to an interesting point. And that is, what lies beyond compromise in our political process? If we're unable through the normal channels of elections and legislation to resolve difficult questions that divide us politically, what then do we do? And I think the answer, um, is a difficult one, and it's, it's a somewhat of an extra political remedy that involves something like uh, either a rethinking of the Constitution or a revolution. Uh, I'll, I'll return to that, what sounds like an extreme thought, in a minute. I'll try to give some more context to it. Um, but I do think it's, it's an open question. I think it's one that polarizing ideas in America's past have resulted in extra constitutional kinds of remedies. I'm thinking, of course, of uh, the Constitution itself and the crisis of the 1790s in America. I'm also thinking of the Civil War. Um, but short of, of these larger constitutional questions, I think one major cause of Trump's nomination is our dysfunctional party system, particularly in, in regards to the nominating process. I think that uh, intentionally and unintentionally, both parties have created an activist nominating system that is largely a plebiscite of party activists, where the most interested, the most polarized partisans show up to determine who's going to uh, serve as the nominee for um, president for their party. 
I think this is a, a long-term move towards what I would call intra-party democracy, which is very much against the traditions in America of party government. Party government used to be a very hierarchical system. We had caucuses. We had, at times, party bosses. Um, but we had the opportunity for party leaders to educate partisans. We had the opportunity for party leaders at times uh, to moderate the views of average voters. And I think um, as uh, George Thomas, my colleague, recently wrote in National Affairs, I, I think um, that that's a mistake. I think that we no longer have the space to deliberate about our candidates. And I think that in our highly polarized moment where we have partisans, uh, the most active and activist partisans choosing our nominees, we ought not to be surprised at the result, particularly when our politics is so divided uh, like it is at this moment. I think this started, I mean, you could really trace its origins back to you know, demands for direct democracy during the progressive era, a kind of doubting of the limitations of the Constitution. I think you, you saw its a modern accomplishment after the McGovern Commission, uh, which came together after the disastrous Democratic Convention in 1968 which tried to make a much more intra-party democracy system choose the president. Of course, the result for the Democrats was they, they nominated McGovern, uh, who was unelectable. Um, and the Democrats backed off from that to a certain degree. Republicans, I don't think, have ever thought it through quite as much as the Democrats have, but they've been sort of swept along these changes by various Democratic legislatures because, of course, it is the states that decide election law, not the federal government, and, and states by and large have chosen uh, direct primaries, increasingly open direct primaries, uh, to select uh, nominees for president. And the parties themselves have sort of assumed that the whole process of, of presidential nominations is simply uh, through an intra-party de democratic way building up enough delegates to become uh, the nominee for president. I find this a very flawed system that is very much open to intemperance, to uh, a misalignment between the, the median American voter uh, and their needs and interests in politics. And I think it presents candidates that are not very appealing uh, to the electorate as a whole. And I think thinking forward from 2016, both parties should think much more carefully about the educative power of parties. They should think more about putting limitations and distance uh, in this process between the activists. I mean, just to give you a, a, a quick note, um, the, in the 2016 primary process, which was the second largest turnout during primaries uh, that we've experienced, the last was our last election, only 28.5% of eligible voters showed up to vote. And those 28.5% of eligible voters, a s further fraction of those, chose to nominate Donald Trump. Now, do I mean d that this should be at 100%? I don't really think that's not only possible, but, but a good idea. I do think that we need to rethink the way in which we nominate our presidents because I think it's, it's very much open to a kind of uh, direct democratic populist impulse that doesn't lead to constructive, useful choices uh, for our, our uh, general election voters. Um, next thing I would say is um, there is a problem with America's working class. I think, you know, since the financial crisis uh, after 2008, um, the equity of the American economy has been in question. Um, and I think Trump was one of the very few nominees who paid attention to that. I think in this enormous field of GOP candidates, he was, you know, however, you know, improbable his, his uh, ideas about um, why these inequities exist. I do think that he was speaking to something that had been percolating particularly on the right, but I think also on the left in a different way, that uh, the political process had left people behind. I think we saw this in the Tea Party protest movement. And I think we've seen a real frustration, uh, uh, alarm in 2016 uh, that, that Trump recognized and was speaking to in ways that other candidates weren't. I, you know, I w in February of this year, before actually, yeah, February, I went to a conference speaking about Trump and was, was speaking that People ought not to take Trump uh, lightly, that he's not a comic figure. Um, Trump provides leadership. He just happens to provide leader of leadership of a very bad sort. 
he leads people towards ideas that I believe are dark and unsettling and frankly un-American. I think he provides bad leadership on immigration. I think his characterization of Mexico in his opening address um, um, spoke to fear, the dar our darkest fears about immigration and immigrants and Mexicans in particular. Um, closing borders to all Muslims, this, this idea was of course preying on our fears about terrorism and, and the Muslim religion. Of course, with each of those issues, whether it's Muslims and, and terror and the idea of what we should do about immigration, there are points at which reasonable people can disagree or agree, and there's needful change to, to be discussed on both sides. But from Trump, we get a very dark and pessimistic and fearful judgment about these issues. And people are willing to follow him. And I think they're willing to follow him because there's something of a political vacuum, or there, at least there was this primary season. And I think that's unfortunate and unlucky. Um, but I do think that Trump is providing a, a kind of leadership, and that's why we should be concerned about him. I think Trump has a disregard for American political tradition that may be exciting in the moment and may satisfy people's frustrations about feeling left behind by our politics. But I think his movements like trying to jail his political opponent if he should get elected, his general lack of decorum that we could call in any way presidential, his undermining of faith in our institutions, particularly institutions like elections and saying that the whole system is rigged does nothing more than break down uh, consent and legitimacy in our politics. And I think that's dangerous and counterproductive. And I think it's another kind of leadership, a kind of anti-political leadership that I think further exposes his ignorance of politics. You know, since when have we ever found a total lack of experience in politics to be a defining characteristic of what we want in our candidate for president? If I said to you that I wanted to nominate one of our students to be a justice of the Supreme Court and, and then say, that, well, the Constitution doesn't prevent me from doing so, you'd laugh me out of the room. And then I'd come back and say, but, but the student is so fresh-faced and will bring such a new look uh, to the Supreme Court. Y you, you'd think I was an idiot. And yet, here we are embracing someone who I think in many ways does represent an unpolitical choice, a kind of vote against the system. Um, and I think you know, he's a dangerous novice who lacks understanding of the Constitution. I think one of the, one of the uh, biggest missed opportunities for Hillary Clinton at the last debate was when Trump was needling her about her accomplishments in the Senate. And Hillary sort of half-heartedly responded that, well, we had a Republican president and he had a veto, but she didn't really press the issue. I mean, he could have been taken to school on the Constitution at that moment, I think. You know, senators can't do whatever they want. No one person can accomplish what they want under our constitutional system. It's impossible, and there's reasons why. But Trump, I don't think, understands that. I think he, he, uh, he thinks that he, he feeds his supporters a kind of apolitical belief that you know a strong man can accomplish anything he wants in our politics, and I think that will only further distance people and frustrate people about what can be accomplished with American politics. So, last thing I'll say is. Um, you know, I think there's, there's two versions of conservatism or even just republicanism that we see sort of separating right at this moment, we, you know, daily in our newspapers, uh, between, say, Paul Ryan, Donald Trump, others who are very confused about what to do between the both of them. Um, and I think that I, I'm gradually coming to a conclusion that really what separates these two brands of conservatism is a belief uh, of whether or not there's a currently a crisis of the American Republic, a very deep and dangerous crisis one that strikes at the heart of uh, the ideas for, of popular government, uh, one that believes in that uh, constitutional restraints um, on uh, executive power have been undermined, um, and that um, basically, is in some sense, the Constitution has become a dead letter. And I think amongst those conservatives, there's a strong belief in Trump. And I think there's a, a strong belief that he might represent some kind of change, and and a change that meets the level of crisis that they observe in our, in our politics. But the last thing I would say is I, I was reading through uh, Harvey Mansfield's uh, Spirit of Liberalism. It's kind of maybe a lesser known book of his. He wrote it in the late 70s. A chapter he calls The Right to Revolution. It's a very interesting chapter. He's writing at the American Bicentennial about this, the notion of whether or not we still have a right to revolution. And he wrote, when we consider the risk of choosing the exercise of the right of revolution, we are reminded of the need to defend this choice. And I guess my question would be, where's the defense? Because I don't see it. 
I see the conservative side of human nature being one of sober prudence, not of revolutionaries. And I think that if we were at this point that has been portrayed of uh, American decline, um, if we truly are beyond compromise or beyond principle and beyond the Constitution, we're asking questions about the re regime itself, I would say to those conservatives who embrace Trump in a vain hope or, or uh, 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 concern for the, for the regime, that they make that case, that they make that defense, because I don't think it's been very well made at all. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, it's, this is you like the debates, right? You, no, may, no applaud. you may applaud. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let me say something um, quickly about three dimensions of, of uh, Trump. Um, and um, uh, preface by my um, uh, admission of how happy and uh, proud I am to be in the government department with uh, Andy Bush and uh, Zach and uh, to be on sharing the pages of, a, of the Claremont Review of Books with uh, uh, Bill Vogley here, who's a senior editor. Um, let me say something about Trump's populism, uh, Trump's conservatism, and Trump's incorrectness. <laughs> um, First thing is, uh, Trump is a kind of populist, but a, of a, a very peculiar kind. Um, his favorite theme is not the people, his favorite theme is uh, the Donald. Uh, you may have noticed this. Um, you know, William Jennings Bryan, famous American populist, didn't run around calling himself the William. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so, it, but there has always been a populist dimension to American conservatism. Bill Buckley, who is you know, usually regarded as an anti-populist, uh, is famous for saying early in his career that he would rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston phone directory than by the faculty of Harvard, which was about 2,000 people at that time. Um, and uh, Trump it builds on this populist discontent, which is as American as apple pie, with um, government. You know, two trends have marked the last 30 or f perhaps even 40 years now. Uh, virtually every year, the government gets larger, more intrusive, more expensive, more ambitious, and every year, Americans trust the government less. Now, these two trends, I think, are, are, are mutually reinforcing, and they've gone on for a long time, and they can, can continue, uh, alas, to, to go for a long time. And as the distrust of government builds, the room for a populist protest against government necessarily has to increase. Now, Her uh, Herb Stein, the economist, famously said that if something can't go on forever, it won't. And uh, I, <laughs> I, I think at some point, uh, these two trends have to, um, there has to be a kind of uh, e eruption uh, and, a, and a kind of um, decision between ever-increasing uh, government and uh, ever-increasing um, hostility to government. Um, I'm not sure that Trump represents the moment when this choice will be made, but it seems to me that his, um, his orientation uh, is, broadly speaking, not that different from the, that of the conservative movement up to this point. Nonetheless, my second point, his conservatism is rather different. He's not a movement conservative. Uh, if, if one could speak of his conservatism in a consistent way, I think it would be closer to the sort of um, uh, conservatism of Richard Nixon. Uh, it's a conservatism that is not really ideological, it's not driven by policy, it's driven by a concern that the center hold, um, that the country be able to be a country, to be a, a political union, and to be capable of being great again, uh, to, to be a people who wants to be a people and wants to be a great one. 
Um, and I, th I think uh, Trump is, is, that's the kind of broadly nationalist conservative um, point that he wants to make. He has said, by the way, something interesting, which is that this, they call this the Republican Party, not the conservative party. And there is a sense in which uh, Trump is returning to old 19th century conservative themes. His protectionism, for example, his abandonment of uh, the uh, you know, doctrine of free trade or the ideology of free trade. I mean, the Republican Party was the party of the high tariff from Abraham Lincoln to Herbert Hoover, at least. All of the years of maximum Re Republican Party popularity and maximum Republican Party political power were years when the party had an, a policy of defending a very high tariff. Um, Trump's comments on NATO and on alliances and so forth, which are regarded as quite heterodox, and they are heterodox in the immediate context of conservative policies, but the basic principle that there should, we should have no permanent alliances uh, is as old as George Washington. Um, Washington's argument was, uh, you know, our, we, our, we, our foreign policy must be guided by our interest and our justice. And that means that uh, we can't have permanent friends and enemies. We have to look anew at situations as the situations change. In itself, there's nothing um, un-American or unsophisticated, I think, about that uh, that argument. You might come to different conclusions about what the foreign policy should be, but th the fact of rethinking it and insisting on our interest as the leading element in our policy seems to me perfectly uh, reasonable. Uh, Trump is coming to terms with a certain failure of conservative policy over the past 20 or so years. This is most explicit, I think, in his attack on the Iraq War. Um, on the proc on the on what became a um, an occup a long occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan for the sake of trying to democratize them, um, this was uh, by almost everyone's admission now a, a, a failure of policy. Uh, maybe uh, Trump is wrong in saying that we went into to Iraq because Bush was deliberately lying about the weapons of mass destruction. He's certainly incorrect about that. Um, but he is, uh, he is uh, pointing up something that the mainstream of the party apparatus has been very reluctant to admit, which is that the Bush administration foreign policy went badly awry and uh, at great cost to America in treasure and in blood, we stayed for a long time to accomplish almost nothing um, in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, there is also the matter of the anti-government or the, uh, the limitations of government arguments that, the, that conservatives have made for many generations. But every time there is a Republican Congress, the electorate is waiting for those limitations on government to emerge. Um, and in fact, they never emerge. Um, Ronald Reagan had some success. That was really the last time that any Republican tried. Uh, and he didn't have, of course, the success that he wanted to, uh, wanted to have. Um, last point is on political correctness. I think the key to Trump's success against 16 more experienced, more polished, more professional candidates in the Republican primaries was that he was prepared to be politically incorrect, not just to denounce it on a checklist of things, but to, uh, uh, to own his political incorrectness, to say things that made, peop that made people, especially liberals and especially people used to campus liberalism, uh, very nervous. Um, and in a way, his candidacy has not stood for any particular policies, although he's been fairly consistent on the question of protectionism, on the question of uh, uh, his opposition to the Iraq a war and to democratization, to nation building and so forth, uh, and uh, on one or two other questions. But essentially, his candidacy is not about issues. It's about um, opposing 
political correctness both as a, not, not so much as a campus phenomenon, but as a phenomenon that links the campus and the politics of the campus to the politics of the country. Uh, he has the sense, and he uh, is not shy about saying so, uh, that the, uh, a kind of politically correct elite has been running the country in both political parties for the past uh, 20 years, uh, and that one, uh, one chief purpose of the regime of political correctness is to put the most serious political questions off the table, to make it impossible to discuss them for fear of being branded a racist, uh, or a sexist, or a homophobe, or any of those categories that fill the basket of deplorables that the, Mrs. Clinton was talking about the other day. Um, uh, to the extent that the Trump candidacy represents a kind of war against political correctness, I fear it's a war that he will lose. <laughs> uh, and my, my suspicion is that even as the tape that was revealed last Friday um, and led to a severe problem in Trump's campaign. My hunch is that there are several more surprises lined up and waiting for Donald Trump, um, much like planes line up to land at LAX. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them ready, you know, NBC or uh, you know, mainstream media and the Democratic Party knows about some of them, but not necessarily all of them, and that uh, they are designed to escalate and will escalate. And I think Trump is in deep trouble um, because of that. But I don't think that, uh, uh, and if he's sunk, I think that will be the, the proximate cause of it, that he's revealed to be a racist or a sexist in the sort of current campus definitions um, of those terms. But my own, I, I am uh, uh, prepared to vote for Trump, um, and the argument that is persuasive to me is simply that he is, he is much better than the alternative. Um, I think Hillary Clinton's regime, uh, her her four years or eight years in office will be an extension essentially of the Obama, uh, of Obama's progressivism. Uh, and if you, if uh, the Supreme Court, which now has three members in their 80s and a, a fourth who is 78, um, will be remade um, into a, a, a forthrightly liberal court under a Democratic president. If you like the Warren court, you'll love this court. Um, with new, new liberal blood on it. Um, and there are so many tendencies in the government which to a conservative are anathema that it, uh, it almost surpasses my imagination how um, many of my friends who are never Trumpers uh, have, can decide to vote for Hillary uh, even if they're not prepared to vote for Trump. But let's leave it at that because we want to have some time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah and I will come to you. Hi, I'm Zippy. Thank you for coming to speak. Um, my question is addressed, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, the last speaker. Um, you mentioned political correctness and not using words or using them by the campus definition, mm. but you didn't use the word sexual assailant. That is what the video showed pretty clearly. So my question to you is why? Why can he get away with so much? And do you think it's in part because he is running against a woman? If Hillary Clinton was a straight white man, would he be doing worse or would he be doing the same? Well, I'm not sure he is going to get away with it, ultimately. Um, and, uh, you know, given his, the kind of life that he's led, uh, th there almost has to be w more and probably worse stuff out there. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, yes, I think it, uh, it helps him somewhat. It, well, I think it hurts him that he's running against a woman, uh, really, because it, uh, it raises this question, you know, in a, uh, in a, in a concrete and ever-present uh, way and and it um, you know he's he's used to um, uh, 
you know, professional wrestling and very male um, thumatic environments of one kind or another. Uh, and I think it is, uh, just politically, it is a di it's, a, it's difficult to make a transition to running against um, a grandmother, um, a mother, uh, and uh, um, a, a, a wife, and um, a woman. Uh, I think that does put him at something of a, of a disadvantage. Hi, thanks for your time tonight. Um, I was really interested in the theme kind of across all four of you about the idea of Americanness and how American is Trump. Um, what does he stand for in terms of the future of our nation, particularly in terms of not only um, constitutional understandings, um, but also the idea of democracy and what our nation was built on. Um, for example, the idea of jailing an opponent um, in a country that stands for free speech and free uh, open political process, but also the idea that we're built on a nation of immigrants and that at least 50% of our population is made up of women um, who can vote despite the recent Twitter phenomenon of repeal the 19th. So I'm curious to hear how you can all speak about that Trump represents kind of this, this new future for America, this um, backlash to problem problems in the political spectrum when I both by kind of all three of those things, his views on immigrants and Muslims in America, on women and on the Constitution, all to me seem directly um, opposed to things that stand for America. Thank you. I want to start at your end, Andy? Well, I, 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 uh, I may have been misunderstood. Um, because I was, I was not necessarily endorsing his, his views. I was pointing out, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, I think, I think where he has made some gains, where he, where he has gotten some political benefit, is that the, um, <coughs> you say the current administration, and to some extent Hillary Clinton as well, um, and that whole kind of political milieu of thinking. Uh, tends to de-emphasize the nation, right? I mean, it, it tends to um, say things like we should be citizens of the world, right? Now, there are certain respects in which that makes some sense. There are a lot of respects in which it makes no sense. I mean, is the UN going to come and fix the pothole in front of my house? Probably not. Uh, are they going to protect my rights as, a, as an American? Certainly not. Uh, and so I, I think that, um, that a lot of ground in terms of patriotism and just you know, basic um, support of the idea of national sovereignty, those are, a lot of that ground has been ceded by Democrats but when they really didn't need to. And I think that Trump has sort of come in and, and taken advantage of some of that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I personally don't see him having a compelling, positive vision of America. And I think that's one of the um, many reasons that he's not going to win. Uh, because I, I, don't, I don't see him having that in a coherent kind of way. Um, I think your point on immigrants um, is, is a good one to an extent. I mean, I think he, uh, he, here's the problem, I think, when it comes to immigration. There are a huge number of Americans who have a serious concern, and I think it's not an illegitimate concern, about illegal immigration, right? The fact that we do have about 11 million people in the United States who, whatever their other um, good aspects, and I think there are many, uh, nevertheless are here in violation of the laws of the country. Uh, and there are concerns about that, but what, what has happened, I think, with Trump is that he's gone way beyond saying, well, we need to try to find some way of limiting illegal immigration or, um, you know, enforcing the immigration laws better. And he's, he has allowed himself or chosen to become uh, a kind of symbol for anti-immigration in general. And, and that I think has uh, damaged him and I think um, it should damage him. Um, when it comes to um, 
Well, maybe I'll just leave it at that and let other people talk. I, I turn your question slightly around <clears throat> and say I think one of the most unfortunate, dangerous, and unanticipated things that I've seen Donald Trump do is tor turn lower class whites into some kind of interest group. I think that um, part of the appeal, when you talk about Americanness and the Constitution and interest groups, and you think about a kind of pluralist society, um, I don't know that we've, at least it, it, you know, since the end of segregation and, and uh, the end of uh, you know, the sort of uh, control of, of uh, segregationist Democrats in the South, I don't think we've really had you know, poor whites as an interest group demanding certain kinds of you know, goods and services as would other minority groups do. And I find this an unsettling and possibly dangerous precedent being set that will do nothing but create more friction and more conflict um, when you know, we now have another interest group out there demand, making demands like other interest groups that's based on being white. Um, I think we've already seen overtones of some troubling, um, you know, the alt-right, for example. Um, but I think just in general, I don't think that's a positive move. I don't think, um, I think it, it may be derives from, from pressures of demography. I think it may derive from the changes that have happened in our economy. But I think uh, Trump has been a catalyst for helping to form that interest group. A catalyst, but of a, a catalyst of elements that were present, and for which I think there's a um, an entirely logical explanation. Um, if you, uh, but my point being that I don't think asymmetrical multiculturalism is uh, politically tenable or morally defensible on a protracted basis. Um, white voters, as as you described them, Zach are, it seems to me, saying, look, you keep telling us that by 2050 we're going to be a minority in this country, but we're going to start acting like a minority. We aren't going to be the only group that uh, is left out of the identity politics game. Um, if, if everybody else gets into uh, politics by um, emphasizing their identity and their victimhood, we're going to do the same thing. Beyond that, to the the, uh, the big um, issue that arose over the summer uh, with the judge in the Trump University case, where uh, uh, the judge is an American citizen, he was born in America, he happens to be of Mexican heritage, uh, and Trump was basically making the argument that, well, I can't get a fair shake from this judge because he's Mexican, right? What is that? That is critical race theory turned around, right? That's, that's nothing by the kind of argument that has come from the left for a really long time that racial, uh, that racial groups can't get a fair shake if, if the judge is from a different racial group because you can't possibly transcend race. We're at a point now where we're starting to see, I think, the, the uglier eventualities of identity politics coming to full fruition. And I think it, it is worrisome. But I think it is also predictable. Hi, thank you all so much for coming to the Athens speaking with us. Um, my question is about realigning elections. It's a, it's a term that we often come across in like government mm. textbooks, like <laughs> a major overhaul of the party <laughs> systems. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that history will look back on this election as a realigning election, and if so, if Mr. Trump wins, what will happen to the Republican Party? Well, David Mayhew wrote that great book discrediting the whole idea, um, so on. I'm loath to, to jump in and say that, you know, does this meet the criteria that we set out for realigning elections? But I, I would tend to say no, simply because I don't think voting for Hillary is, is going to realign anything if, <laughs> if, if she's the likely winner. Um, I, I do think it's fair to say that she will likely continue the policies of the Obama administration with some variation, but largely keeping with the theme. And I think whatever critical or realigning moment will happen after 2016, and I think as we head to November and see it's less and less likely that Trump is going to be elected, um, the real questions is going, to be, is, is going to be how will the Republican Party fare? What's it going to look like in January? You know, if there's no Speaker Ryan or if there is a Speaker Ryan, um, what about people who supported Trump who didn't? You know, when do the, when do the show trials begin? 
you know, uh, <laughs> where the Republicans, uh, you know, ask you, and, and this becomes a litmus test, were you for or against Trump? And I think, you know, in the, the messy aftermath of all that, we may get a sense of what could be a realigning moment for the Republican Party. But I think right now, I think we're just at the moment of decomposition. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's, it would be maybe more like 1964, where you might get um, super majorities of Democrats elected in the legislature, which would allow for another series of legislative breakthroughs for the Democratic coalition, <laughs> but that uh, the real question would be where does the where does conservatism, where does the Republican Party go from here? And there's a, you know, there's a sort of civil, a minor civil war within the Republican Party for a bit, um, maybe more than minor, but I, I actually doubt that, to decide how to incorporate some of the Trumpian themes and all of the Trumpian voters into a renewed conservative or Republican um, party. And I do think you know, uh, the party and conservatism will have to change somewhat to accommodate um, the Trump phenomenon. Uh, I don't think conservatism will go back to being everything it was before and, and not with no, uh, no uh, alterations forced by, um, by, by Trump's successes and failures. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you guys have brought up a lot of really interesting and important questions about um, underlying ideology of the candidate and the candidates to an extent and how, you know, what, what's going to win out in terms of the election. But how, how important do you think the economic factors are in, into this election? And do you think that um, an economic event or an economic condition or at least perceived condition among the American public could sway voters one way or another kind of uh, irrelevant of all these important ideological questions that this election has raised. Thank you. I'm sorry, do, something between now and election day, an, an economic event could? For what it's worth, I, I, I think the, um, a, a lot of the reason Trump was able to win the nomination and be for a while competitive in the general election was that um, there's growing, um, growing skepticism, as, as Charles Kessler uh, alluded to, about the ability of government to do anything well or effectively or helpful in this area. In a way, it is uh, you remember the famous bitter clinger remark that uh, or, uh, Barack Obama as a presidential candidate in 2008 was found to have made. But the run up to that was, was uh, Mr. Obama said to a, a room full of Democratic donors uh, that you go into these small towns in the Rust Belt and people were told during the uh, Clinton presidency in the 90s and the George W. Bush presidency that the policies were going to change and these towns that had once been prosperous would be prosperous again. And people who live there have seen their incomes decline and decline and their opportunities dwindle. And uh, it, it seems to me that um, the, the, the reason that a, an improbable figure like Donald Trump could win the nomination of one of our, our two major parties is that um, uh, people say, how much worse can we do, really? Um, when, when Trump says, this is a direct quote, we, our, our country is run by very, very stupid people, this is an applause line um, in, in the kinds of towns that Barack Obama was talking about. And the fact is that this prophecy that, that Obama made is, is largely what, whatever the rec economic recovery is in general terms, is largely applicable to his presidency as well. Those towns he was talking about are in worse shape now than they were in 2008. So I think that um, it is not so much a uh, uh, voting a w your wallet as it is a sense that since neither party, neither candidate, no program, no agenda, 
no party platform is going to make any discernible difference to how my life rolls out. I might as well vote my sort of raw emotions and angers and, 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 and my disdain for the entire political class of which Mr. Trump is not a part. One more question. Uh, thank you for your talk. And I'm not sure exactly who spoke about it, but one of you said that um, essentially the American people have potentially um, gone astray, astray from the, the value of truth in when evaluating our candidates. And what I wanted to ask was essentially how do you see how Trump has reacted to his mistakes or things that have come out negatively to affect him? Um, because he doesn't often say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Uh, he often says, oh, I didn't do that, or no, that wasn't true. Um, but we have seen, especially as um, more prominent videos come out that affect more people, he has said, I'm sorry, or I was wrong, or I apologize for that. Um, and as we enter a time where more and more things are recorded, um, people do make mistakes, and these mistakes are bound to come out in future elections. Um, do you think this will provoke authenticity from the candidates and how the American people select them? Or do you think it will um, kind of encourage candidates to be dissuaded from the truth uh, and more inauthentic. Thank you. Well, it's a good question. I mean, it's easier to catch people now, right? Uh, it's, it's harder for candidates to um, claim that they didn't say something or didn't do something when there's this kind of evidence uh, out there. Um, I think you know, the, the question to an extent is um, whether Americans will insist to some, to in some way on candidates um, acting with integrity before they get caught, <laughs> right? Because they always say, I mean, Bill Clinton said, uh, well, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I mean, there was this, you know, after he was caught, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. Uh, Hillary Clinton, in the first debate, said, well, yeah, the, the, the email thing was a mistake, I'm sorry. It's very easy to say you're sorry, right? I mean, people do get caught more often, but the question is whether anybody cares that they were lying before that, uh, or is it just good enough to kind of say, well, I'm sorry, and then go on and continue doing other, other things. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, that's, that's gonna be up to, to voters, and right now, it's, uh, you know, this isn't gonna be a test of that, right, because it, it, it's, I wouldn't really argue that one of the candidates is significantly more honest than the other one. So uh, the, there's not gonna be a test of whether the American people are going to insist on somewhat greater honesty because no matter who wins, it's, it's not really uh, going to be the, the honest candidate. Um, but I think that's a question for the future. And um, whatever happens, no one can say they were disappointed. Um, that I, I think that the, um, the level of distrust and cynicism about government and the political class has reached the point where um, uh, th there is, in a sense, <coughs> a, a sort of um, pervasive amorality. Nobody believes anything, nobody believes in anyone, nobody expects anything. So th the lies and the post-lie apology are all sort of pro forma and part of the game. So it, it seems that um, uh, the sense, to go back to your question, that, that truth, honesty, candor is some sort of uh, standard is increasingly difficult to get your arms around. Trump offers something in, in, as a substitute for it, which is just um, a sort of bellicosity and, and just, just speaking in a uh, loud, angry, off-the-cuff manner and people um, think that there's a kind of authenticity there. It's, it's not something they've seen from, um, from professional politicians who seem um, polished and to have focus grouped their answers and to have considered before they, they respond to any question the 17 different um, subsets of the electorate that they need to uh, appeal to. He just, bam, says things. And he says a lot of dumb things and offensive things, but he also, uh, gives people the sense that there, there isn't this series of masks that he's hiding behind that have been carefully constructed over a long time. And I think that has been, in a perverse way, a sort of advantage for him. You brought up truth. Did I? <laughs> yeah. 
No, well, I would say, yes, I mean, the, the, does anyone really think these apologies are sincere? I mean, they are part of the, of the game of, of uh, you know, identity politics and political correctness that we were talking about. You're expected to apologize, and therefore you apologize. Uh, do you really regret it? Well, I don't know. That's a question of authenticity. Some, uh, I mean, some people are, are, are authentically moral slobs, <laughs> but they will apologize if, it's, if they think it's to their advantage to apologize. And which means if the, uh, if the cost to not apologizing is high enough. But it's, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, in American politics, until very recently, there was not this you know, merry-go-round of apologies uh, and uh, people taking offense at things that were said. Um, it, was a, it was a more candid form of politics where people may have been offended, but that's too bad because you know, people disagree about issues. Their opinions about justice clash in many cases. Certainly their opinions about advantage clash. And uh, in some respects the country was more free when uh, people did not have to fear um, or did not have to run the apology gauntlet uh, but could uh, tell you what they really think and that is, I think, exactly what Trump uh, has tapped into. I, I guess I will say one thing. I was, I'm reminded I used to work in Washington state politics and I remember working on a campaign where the, the Washington state Supreme Court handed down a ruling that it was okay to lie during a campaign. <laughs> and for a, a moment the political class you know, shuddered. What? You can lie in a campaign? Ridiculous. We want to criminalize this behavior. Why, how could any honest, you know, God-fearing person lie during a campaign? Uh, to me, it was it was a, a kind of ridiculous extension of of an of a unrealistic view of human nature, and of politics. Um, that I think you know we have suffered in. I, there's there's a burgeoning school of thought called political realism out there that I'm I'm somewhat interested in and, and think has some potential that says that politics should be more transactional and that um, not that there's room for lies but there's less certainty about the truth uh, in politics. And a lot of what we're supposed to be mm -hmm. doing in the public space is debating and figuring out what's true and what's not and drawing some conclusions as citizens but not trying to shackle, to use a word that I heard recently, <laughs> uh, people's uh, ability to speak out uh, politically. We don't want to chill speech, even if that speech happens to be either something you don't believe in or might not be true. And I think that space has eroded a great deal, and I think it's um, deadened our politics to a degree. So uh, if the American people demand truthfulness and uh, forthrightness in their candidates, uh, I think they will get it to the degree in which human nature makes that possible. Thank you.